thank you for subscribing to our channel. In this latest video, we focus on the listening subtest of the Occupational English Test. This session is designed with an exam-oriented approach. We encourage you to share your score in the comments section below. Happy learning. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. You hear a patient called Sarah Williams talking to her GP about digestive issues that she is facing. Now you have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Miss Williams. I understand you've been dealing with some digestive issues recently? Yes, that's correct. Initially, I only experienced mild indigestion, which I could manage without too much trouble. However, over the, over the past two years, the situation has worsened and I've been dealing with persistent acid reflux that just won't go away. At first, I could still handle it with some lifestyle changes, but over the last six months, things have gotten significantly worse. I've started getting stomach cramps on a regular basis and these cramps have become so intense lately that they're really affecting my day-to-day -day life. It's reached a point where it's difficult to concentrate on anything else because the pain is so overwhelming. That sounds difficult. Can you describe the symptoms for me? It's difficult to describe exactly. The symptoms are somewhat unclear, but if I had to pinpoint it, I'd say it now feels more like a burning sensation. This shift has been particularly frustrating for me because... At the beginning, it was diagnosed as a simple case of acid reflux. I thought it would be manageable with some basic treatment, but as time has gone on, it seems like it's becoming something more complicated. The fact that it doesn't seem to match the original diagnosis makes it even more concerning for me. How has this affected your daily life? I'm a teacher, so I'm on my feet a lot, but lately it's become really challenging to stand for long periods. The pain has gotten so bad that I even had to take sick leave recently because I just couldn't manage anymore. It wasn't just the standing either, even simple tasks like cooking at home have started to feel exhausting. I used to enjoy these activities, but now they leave me completely drained. I feel like I'm tired all the time and it's really starting to affect my daily life. Have you made any changes to your diet? I've been actively adjusting my diet in an effort to manage my symptoms better. Initially, I started by avoiding spicy and acidic foods because I noticed they tended to trigger discomfort and worsen my acid reflux. However, even after eliminating these from my meals, I realized that dairy products seem to aggravate my condition further. Observing this pattern, I decided to cut out all dairy completely in hopes of reducing my symptoms. In addition to these dietary changes, I began incorporating herbal teas into my daily routine, thinking they might aid digestion and provide some relief. Despite regularly drinking these teas, I haven't noticed a significant improvement in how I feel the herbal teas haven't made much of a difference in alleviating my discomfort. Seeking further solutions, I experimented with a gluten-free diet for a period of time, believing that eliminating gluten might help ease my digestive issues. Unfortunately, after adhering to this diet for a while, I didn't experience any noticeable improvement in my symptoms. Overall, despite my efforts to modify my diet by avoiding certain foods, cutting out dairy, drinking herbal teas, and trying a gluten-free regimen, I continue to struggle with persistent discomfort. These adjustments haven't provided the relief I was hoping for, and I'm still searching for effective ways to manage my condition. What about medications? When I first started experiencing symptoms, my doctor prescribed antacids to help manage the discomfort. At the beginning, they were somewhat effective in alleviating the indigestion and acid reflux I was dealing with. However, over time, I've noticed that the antacids are no longer providing the relief they once did. It feels like my body has become accustomed to them and they just don't work as well anymore. 
During my last visit, I discussed these concerns with my doctor. He mentioned that given the persistent nature of my symptoms and the diminishing effectiveness of the antacids, it might be necessary to explore other treatment options. He brought up the possibility of starting me on proton pump inhibitors, PIs, which are stronger medications designed to reduce stomach acid production more effectively than antacids. My doctor also mentioned that if my condition doesn't improve with medication, we might need to consider more aggressive treatments, including the possibility of surgery. So he explained that surgery could be an option if the medication fails to control the symptoms or if there are complications that need to be addressed surgically. The idea of surgery is a bit daunting, but I understand that it might be necessary if other treatments don't work. For now, I'm hoping that the proton pump inhibitors will help manage my symptoms more effectively, but I'm aware that we'll have to reassess the situation if there's no improvement. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You will hear a patient called John Patterson, who is experiencing dull pain in his chest, talking to his doctor. Good afternoon, Mr. Patterson. How have you been feeling since your last visit? Unfortunately, things haven't improved much, and I'm still struggling. For the past six months, I've been dealing with this persistent dull pain in my chest. It's not something that comes and goes, it's pretty constant, and it's starting to become a real concern for me. The pain seems to get noticeably worse after I eat, almost like my body is reacting negatively to food. Because of this, my appetite has started to suffer. I find myself eating less and feeling apprehensive about meals because I know that the pain is likely to follow. It's been a frustrating experience, and I'm starting to worry about how this is impacting my overall health and well-being. I see. Any other symptoms? Yes, I've definitely noticed that the pain is sometimes accompanied by a burning sensation, which makes it even more uncomfortable and concerning. It's not just the physical discomfort that's troubling me. This whole situation has been triggering my anxiety quite a bit. I've struggled with anxiety issues in the past, and dealing with this ongoing pain has really exacerbated those feelings. Every time the burning sensation starts, I can't help but worry about what might be causing it, and that worry quickly spirals into anxiety. It's been challenging to manage both the physical symptoms and the emotional stress that comes with it. Oh, I see. How has this impacted your daily activities? Aim, I work as a knit consultant, which means I spend a lot of time sitting at a desk, and that has become increasingly uncomfortable. Sitting for long periods used to be something I hardly noticed, but now it's a real challenge. I've even stopped going to the gym, which I used to enjoy because I just don't have the energy anymore. It's frustrating because exercise was a big part of my routine, and now it feels like I can't even manage that. My sleep has also been affected. I find myself waking up several times during the night, unable to get the restful sleep I need. This lack of sleep is leaving me feeling drained throughout the day, making it even harder to focus on work or find the motivation to stay active. Okay. Have you made any changes to your diet? I've been making an effort to eat healthier, so I've added more salads and vegetables to my meals. I still enjoy my usual coffee in the morning, though I just can't seem to give that up. I've also started cutting down on fried foods, trying to be more conscious of what I'm eating. My wife recently suggested that I try following a Mediterranean diet, which she believes could be beneficial, but to be honest, I'm not sure if that would make much of a difference or if it's the right choice for me. I'm open to the idea, but I could use some guidance on whether it's worth trying or if there's something else I should focus on instead. Okay, I understand that. What about your medication? I had been taking antacids for a while, but unfortunately they didn't seem to be making much of a difference. The relief was minimal and the symptoms just kept persisting. During my last visit, my GP decided to switch me to a different medication. I've noticed a slight improvement since I started taking it. There's been some relief, but it's been a gradual process. The progress feels slow, and while it's better than before, I'm still not where I'd like to be in terms of managing the symptoms. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, Choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question 
before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. His new medication is specifically designed to help manage your blood pressure more effectively, so it's important that you take it exactly as prescribed. You'll need to take one tablet twice a day morning and evening. If you happen to miss a dose, don't try to double up the next one to make up for it. Instead, take the missed dose as soon as you remember, unless it's already close to the time for your next scheduled dose. Yeah. In that case, just skip the missed one and continue with your regular routine. Additionally, it's best to take this medication with food. Doing so will not only help with better absorption, but also reduce the likelihood of any stomach discomfort that can sometimes occur. Will I experience any side effects? Some people may notice mild dizziness or headaches, but these usually pass as your body adjusts. If you experience anything severe, contact us immediately. When you perform this exercise, it's absolutely crucial to maintain the correct posture throughout. Make sure to keep your back straight and be mindful to engage your core muscles. This will help protect your lower back from any strain. I'll demonstrate the exercise for you first so you can see exactly how it's done. After that, I'll guide you step by step as you try it yourself. If at any point you start to feel any discomfort or pain, stop right away and let me know. It's really important to move slowly and carefully, especially when you're just starting out, to avoid any unnecessary strain or injury. I believe I've got a good grasp on the exercise now. However, I'd feel more confident if you could observe me while I perform it. This way, I can ensure that I'm following the correct technique and making the necessary adjustments. Your feedback would be really helpful to confirm that I'm doing it right and to catch any mistakes before they become a problem. I'll begin now and please let me know if there's anything I need to correct or improve upon. I have some concerns regarding Mrs. Thomas's current situation. She has been on the new medication for a full week now, but unfortunately we haven't observed significant improvements in her symptoms. I've meticulously reviewed her dosage instructions and can confirm that she's been following them correctly and consistently. Despite this, the lack of noticeable progress raises a red flag. Given these circumstances, I am beginning to wonder if it might be prudent to reevaluate her overall treatment plan to determine if adjustments are needed. This could involve considering alternative medications, changing dosages, or explore exploring additional therapies to better address her symptoms and enhance her recovery. Have there been any side effects? None that she's mentioned, but I'll keep a close eye on her just in case. We might need to consult with the doctor to see if there's a need to adjust her medication. This dietary regimen has been carefully crafted with the objective of optimizing your blood sugar management. A central component of this plan is the principle of portion control, which involves meticulously regulating the quantities of various food groups with a particular emphasis on carbohydrates. To assist you in this process, I will provide you with a detailed guide that outlines the composition of a representative meal, ensuring you achieve a well-balanced nutritional intake throughout the day. While it is imperative to steer clear of foods with high sugar content, it is equally essential to maintain a consistent eating schedule. This means that skipping meals or snacks is to be avoided as such irregularities can precipitate erratic fluctuations in blood sugar levels. The goal is to harmonize your intake patterns to prevent any potential spikes or drops in your blood glucose, thereby supporting more stable metabolic control. That makes sense. Could you give me examples of appropriate portion sizes? Absolutely, I'll provide you with a detailed list.
Considering Mr. Andrew's extensive history with cardiovascular disease, I find myself leaning towards endorsing the less invasive treatment modality. But although his present symptomatology remains relatively stable, I harbor significant concerns regarding the inherent risks and potential adverse outcomes associated with surgical intervention particularly when factoring in his advanced age and the complications he experienced during his previous surgical procedure. Consequently, the proposed strategy involves managing his condition through pharmacological therapy at this juncture, while implementing a rigorous monitoring protocol to closely observe his progress. This approach aims to mitigate the risks associated with more invasive options and ensure that we address his condition with a conservative yet vigilant methodology. That seems like a prudent strategy. Have you communicated this plan to Mr. Andrews? Indeed, I have engaged in a thorough discussion with him regarding this approach. Mr. Andrews has expressed a strong preference to circumvent surgical options whenever feasible, thus he concurs with and supports this proposed course of action. Before we commence the procedure, I'd like to underscore the critical importance of maintaining a high level of coordination and communication among the entire surgical team. This case presents significant complexity, requiring a meticulous and synchronized approach from all involved. As I will be taking the lead role in this operation, it's imperative that each team member remains vigilant and promptly communicates any concerns or observations that arise during the procedure. Additionally, we must monitor the patient's vital signs with utmost diligence. Given the patient's underlying condition, we anticipate potential fluctuations in these parameters, which necessitates a readiness to respond with swift and precise actions. It is crucial that we are prepared to address any issues that may arise promptly to ensure the smooth execution of the surgery. Understood. We will ensure that all necessary preparations are in place and maintain vigilant communication throughout the procedure. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. My name is Dr. Anne Roberts, and I specialize in cardiology with a particular focus on helping patients recover from heart attacks. Today, I want to discuss a case that underscores the critical importance of lifestyle changes after recovery, something I believe is essential for ensuring long-term health following a heart attack. Take my patient John, for instance. John experienced his first heart attack at the age of 52. At the time, he dismissed the chest pain he felt as indigestion, which is not uncommon among men of his age. 
It wasn't until the pain became unbearable that he sought medical attention, but by then significant damage had already occurred. This delay in seeking treatment is often a major obstacle to effective intervention. John's recovery journey was typical in many respects. Initially, he was hesitant to fully engage with the rehabilitation program, finding it difficult to integrate into his already busy work schedule. However, as time went on, he began to recognize the value of the program's holistic approach, particularly the mental health support, which he found to be extremely beneficial. Unfortunately, a year later, John suffered a minor heart attack. This time, however, his response was markedly different. He became deeply committed to his rehabilitation, fully understanding the gravity of his condition. This shift in attitude is something I observe frequently. A first heart attack may not always convince patients of the need for change, but a second event often does. A common issue I encounter in my practice is patients' reluctance to adhere to the necessary lifestyle changes such as dietary adjustments. Many patients tend to rely too heavily on medications, believing that pills alone will address their issues. However, Without tackling the underlying lifestyle factors, the risk of experiencing another heart attack remains alarmingly high. This is why I emphasize the importance of follow-up appointments. These sessions are crucial not just for monitoring the effectiveness of medication, but also for reinforcing the importance of lifestyle modifications and adjusting the treatment plan as needed. Regular follow-ups ensure that patients like John remain committed to their recovery journey and significantly reduce their risk of future heart attacks. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Michael Green, and I'm a pediatrician specializing in respiratory conditions with a particular focus on childhood asthma. Asthma is a chronic condition that affects the airways in the lungs, causing them to become inflamed and narrowed, which makes breathing difficult. Managing asthma effectively presents numerous challenges, especially when it comes to diagnosing and treating this condition in children. One of the significant difficulties in managing asthma is the variability in symptoms among different children. For instance, while one child might experience frequent and severe wheezing, another might only have occasional bouts of coughing. This variation can make it challenging to diagnose asthma accurately. Additionally, the symptoms of asthma such as wheezing, coughing, and shortness of breath can overlap with those of other respiratory conditions like bronchitis or allergies, further complicating the diagnostic process. There are also several misconceptions about asthma that can hinder effective management. A common belief among parents is that asthma is something children will outgrow. While it is true that some children may experience a reduction in symptoms as they get older, this is not guaranteed for everyone. Many children will continue to have asthma into adulthood and will require ongoing management. Another misconception is that asthma can be completely cured. Unfortunately, while we can effectively control and manage the symptoms with medication and lifestyle changes, there is no cure for asthma. Inhalers are a critical component of asthma management, but their effectiveness hinges on proper use. 
I frequently encounter situations where both parents and children struggle with the correct technique for using inhalers. Incorrect usage can significantly diminish the effectiveness of the medication, making it crucial to provide thorough guidance on how to use these devices properly. Another concern is the tendency for some parents to delay seeking medical help for their child's asthma symptoms. Many parents may believe that the symptoms will improve on their own, but this delay can lead to severe complications that could have been prevented with early intervention. To illustrate the importance of timely and effective management, let me share a case from my practice. Sarah, a patient diagnosed with asthma at the age of five, initially faced resistance from her parents regarding daily medication due to concerns about potential side effects. However, after Sarah experienced a severe asthma attack that required hospitalization, her parents understood the necessity of consistent management. With regular follow-ups and adherence to a comprehensive management plan, Sarah's asthma is now well-controlled, allowing her to lead a normal and active life. In conclusion, improving asthma management in children requires both increased public awareness and comprehensive training for parents and caregivers. Effective asthma management is not solely about having the right medications but also about understanding how and when to use them appropriately. By addressing these aspects we can help children with asthma lead healthier, more active lives.